Take your love here on VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, you will hear stories from Anna Mateo and Jill Robbins. Brian Lynn presents this week's technology report. We close the show with the lesson of the day. But first, Anna Mateo tells us about a special library found in the Philippines. A good book is easy to find. That is the message on a sign at Hernando Guanlao's home in the Makati area of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Guanlao has turned his home into a free public library. Visitors can borrow the books inside for free. Guan Lao says he hopes his library will inspire people to read, especially the young. The 72 year old told reporters that his library includes books that all students can enjoy, from young children in kindergarten to older students in grade 12. Guan Lao says his library has books for readers of all interests. He spoke to reporters at his home, which is filled with thousands of available books. He calls his library Reading Club 2000. It contains many different kinds of books or genres. Genre is a group of artistic, musical, or literary works that share a particular style, form, or content. Some genres in literature are poetry, nonfiction or real stories, and fiction or imaginary stories. Then there are sub genres, such as cookbooks, science fiction, and mystery, to name just a few. Guanlao added there are also spiritual books for those who are looking for religious knowledge, hardbound and softbound books, autobiographies, and many different genres that one can enjoy, all for free. He started his library more than 20 years ago, when he set 50 books on the walkway in front of his home. Guan Lao's collection has grown greatly over the years, thanks to a continuous supply of books from donors. Speaking of donors, he said, they just leave boxes of books outside my house. He has also started donating books himself. He sends reading materials to public schools in faraway communities. Guan Lao's efforts come at a time when reading ability among students in the Philippines remains low. The Program for International Student Assessment reports that reading scores in the Philippines are among the lowest in the world. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development runs that program. Students in the Philippines are also facing learning delays in math and science. Guan Lao is firm about his goals. My mission is to give away used and donated books to others at no cost, he said, and to promote education through literature. I'm Ana Mateo. In her small home in the capital of Greece, Athens, 93-year-old Iona Matsuoka has knit thousands
thousands of brightly colored scarves for children in need from Greece to Bosnia to Ukraine. She has no plans to stop just yet. Until I die, I will be knitting, Matsuoka told Reuters. Her knitting tools, called needles, made noises through her expert fingers, her nails painted red. It brings me joy to share them, she said. Since she took up knitting in the 1990s, Matsuoko has easily made over 3,000 scarves, her daughters estimate. By the door to her home, bags filled with her latest creations await their new owners. A knitted blanket is thrown over a large chair where she spends her days. In the beginning, the scarves were gifted to friends. As the number of scarves grew, they were donated to children's homes across Greece. Then, through people she knew, they reached children in Bosnia and Ukraine. The latest 70 scarves went to a refugee camp near Athens this winter via the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR. The fact that we give them away gives her strength, said her daughter, Angeliki. She recounted simple artwork and mail her mother received over the years. Thank you. Be well. Keep going. You gave joy to children. You gave joy to people. That's her only reward. A letter, a few words. Matsuoka knits one scarf a day now. Her eyesight suffers and she sometimes has severe facial pain, a condition known as trigeminal neuralgia. Angeliki says her mother is an example of strength and hope. Matsuoka wakes up every morning, drinks a glass of milk, puts on her jewelry, and gets to work. She takes a break for lunch and a short sleep, then knits into the night. She may have even found the secret to a long life in it, she says. It's the happiness I get from giving, she said, sitting beside a big blue bag filled with the knitting materials. I'm Jill Robbins. An American insurance industry group has given most driver assistance systems poor ratings after a series of safety tests. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, IIHS, carried out the tests. The group released a report this week describing its findings. The tests involved 14 different driver assistance tools. Such tools offer partial driving automation as a way to improve safety and reduce accidents. The systems are equipped to assist drivers with things like staying inside road lines and automatically slowing or stopping the car when possible dangers are identified. The IIHS is a non-profit organization financed by America's insurance industry. The group carries out numerous crash tests each year as it seeks to persuade automakers to design safer vehicles. Automakers follow safety ratings issued by the group and often make changes to products based on them. The IIHS noted there is a lack of effective tools to monitor drivers and provide warnings when they need to pay better attention or take immediate corrective action. David Harkey is president of the IIHS. He told the Associated Press 
His group aims to set guidelines for manufacturers to make up for a lack of regulation over the systems by the U.S. National Highway Safety Administration. Harkey noted that most current driver assist systems do not have effective measures to prevent misuse and keep drivers from losing focus on what's happening on the road. All automakers advise drivers using assistance tools not to fully depend on vehicle technologies to keep them safe. The companies say the tools are meant to improve or enhance overall safety rather than take over certain driving duties. The IIHS said it tested 14 different driver assist systems. Of those, 11 received an overall rating of poor. Two other systems were rated marginal, while one was considered acceptable. Harkey said the 14 systems are among the highest quality technologies currently on the market. The driver assist system used in the Lexus LS model earned the acceptable rating. The marginal declarations were given to systems in General Motors' GMC Sierra and Nissan's area electric vehicle. Other systems from Nissan, Tesla, BMW, Ford, Genesis, Mercedes-Benz, and Volvo received ratings of poor. Harkey said the high level of technology sophistication in today's driver assist systems provides a lot more automation possibilities. But these tools can cause drivers not to pay attention for longer periods, presenting new dangerous risks. That's why the focus is on how do we make sure that the driver remains focused on the driving, he added. The IIHS has warned that manufacturers advertise their vehicles in a way that gives drivers the false idea that they are fully automated or autonomous. The one thing we do not want is for drivers to misinterpret what these things can or cannot do, Harkey said. The IIHS is calling for automakers to build additional tools into their systems. These would be designed to observe whether or not a driver's eyes are directed at the road and whether their hands are on the wheel or ready to immediately take control. The Institute suggested the systems should have built-in tools that send warnings to drivers within 10 seconds if their eyes and hands are not in the right positions. At 20 seconds, the IIHS said the system should add another warning or start an automatic emergency process to slow down the vehicle. Toyota, which makes Lexus vehicles, said it considers IIHS reports when it creates safety guidelines, while General Motors called the ratings important. Nissan said it will work with the Institute on proposed changes. Mercedes said it takes the findings seriously, while Hyundai Genesis said it was quickly improving its system including plans to put a camera inside vehicles. BMW said while it respects IIHS's efforts, it differs on the use of technology to monitor drivers inside the vehicle. Ford said its driver assist system monitors drivers and sends repeated warnings. While Ford said it disagrees with the Institute's findings, it will consider the suggestions in future development. I'm Brian Lynn.
Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about the technology report. Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here. Of course, Ashley. Thanks for having me. The study you reported on rates the latest driver assistance systems on the market quite low. How much do you think these results will affect future development changes by car makers? So the automakers did react quickly to this new study, and generally they welcomed the results and suggested they would consider the findings in future design and development. And this is the reaction one would expect to see since the insurance industry group carrying out the research has a good established relationship with the manufacturers. Um, The group regularly does this kind of road testing and makes recommendations. And since the automakers have a high level of respect and trust for the group, um, they do often respond by making the suggested changes. Since the group gave all the systems generally low ratings, how do you think drivers using these tools should feel about the results? I think uh, the results really address one major issue, that many drivers can reduce their attention when depending too much on driver assist systems for help. And this can, of course, increase the risk of accidents. Um, The systems for sure are helpful, and the insurance industry acknowledges that, but this group is really just calling for additional measures in these systems to essentially force drivers to pay more attention and be ready to take control of their vehicles quickly if something does go wrong. Okay. Thanks for answering my questions, Brian, and thank you for your report. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Listening to the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. Today, we're going to start by listening to a few little words and sounds Americans typically use at the beginning of sentences. Mm hmm. That's right. Which one should we do first? Um, how about. Let's do that! <laughs> you just said it. Um. Oh, yeah, I did. And we can hear it in Lesson 8 of the Let's Learn English series. Anna goes to the recording studio in her workplace to apologize to her co worker, Jonathan. See if you can hear Jonathan say that little word, um. Hi, Jonathan. Are you busy? Yes, I'm busy. When the studio light is on, I am recording my evening show. Right. Sorry about yesterday. No worries. May I see the studio? Um, maybe another time? Right now, I am busy. Sure. Okay. Bye. Bye. I noticed Jonathan said, um, after Anna asked him a question. That's right. We usually say, um, to show that we are thinking about an answer. We also use it, like Jonathan did, to help us say no in a nice, polite way. Our listeners can hear this explained again with more examples by using the pronunciation practice video in Lesson 8 of Let's Learn English. Each lesson in 
Let's Learn English Level 1 has a pronunciation practice video. You can find it on our website below the main video and the speaking practice video. Let's hear the first part of that practice video. Hesitation noises. When Americans want more time to think about what they are saying, they often use a hesitation noise, like a uh or um. Listen to Jonathan when he is talking to Anna. He does not want Anna to see what he is doing in the studio. May I see the studio? Um, maybe another time? Right now, I am busy. Now you try it. Use um to make more time to answer a question. What is 1,012 and 536? Um, it's 1,548. The mathematics problem was a good example of when we typically say, um. And remember, you can learn more by going to the Learning English website and using the Let's Learn English lessons. That's right. I'm Jill Robbins, and you're listening to the Learning English Podcast. Lesson 8 also shows how people answer Anna when she apologizes. Anna says sorry many times. Sorry about yesterday. I'm sorry for yesterday. Well, I am sorry. In fact, Americans often say they are sorry for bothering someone even when it is for only small mistakes or problems. And they accept apologies by saying, it's okay, or no problem. And no worries is also a popular way to accept an apology. That's right. It is an expression we often think of in connection with Australian speakers of English. You might hear a movie character called Crocodile Dundee say, No worries, mate. We also use no worries in emails to show that we do not want the other person to worry. Let's hear Anna apologize again, this time to both Jonathan and her co-worker Amelia. Listen for how Jonathan and Amelia answer with no worries and it's okay. Hi, Jonathan. Are you busy? Yes, I'm busy. When the studio light is on, I am recording my evening show. Right. Sorry about yesterday. No worries. May I see the studio? Um, maybe another time? Right now, I am busy. Sure. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hi, Amelia? Are you busy? I'm a little busy. I want to say I'm sorry for yesterday. It's okay, Anna. Well, I am sorry. It's okay, Anna. Come by this afternoon. Okay. There's another small word at the beginning of sentences that our listeners can learn to use. Oh? What's that? You just said it. Oh, I did. Okay, I admit I said that on purpose because we want our listeners to hear the different tone of voice we use with this little word, oh. But instead of listening to me, let's listen to Anna. In Lesson 9, Anna wants to check the weather in Washington, D.C. She wants to know if it will be warm or cold. Listen carefully. She says oh two times, right at the beginning and near the end. Oh, hi everyone. Here in Washington, D.C., the weather changes often. One day is cold and windy, but the next day is warm and sunny. So every day I check the forecast. 
Hello, phone. What is today's temperature? Today, it is 18 degrees. 18 degrees? That is cold. 18 degrees Celsius. Oh, Celsius. That is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. That's warm. Yes, Anna. It is warm. The first time she says, oh, it's very fast. She says, oh, hi, everyone. The O oh shows that she is a little surprised because in the video she is reading a book and then notices that the camera is filming her. The way she says O oh also gives an informal tone to her speaking. The second time she says O oh shows that she was wrong about the temperature. When we notice that we made a mistake, or believed something that was not true, we say, oh. And we can say, oh, in a few different ways to show this. If we are wrong about a small detail that's not too important, we usually say the word quickly and with a lower tone of voice, like, oh, okay, I get it. And then if the mistake is a little bigger, the sound usually gets longer, like this, oh. And if we make a really big mistake, we usually make it sound much longer, like this, oh. That's right. You're listening to the Learning English Podcast. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. Andrew, we have explained how to use O oh when we are wrong or make a mistake. But maybe we should explain what we say when we get a big surprise. That's a good idea. Um, here's an example. Jill, what would you say if I told you that I got married this past weekend? You got married? Oh my gosh! Okay, I have to be honest. I did not get married. But you gave a good example. When you heard a big surprise, you said, Oh my gosh! And gosh is spelled G-O-S-H. And many people will say, Oh my God! to show that they are very surprised or excited. However, some people try not to say God in that way because of their religious beliefs. So they will say gosh instead. Gee, when you think about it, there are a lot of small words we say at the beginning of sentences. Yep, there sure are. And I think our listeners can understand that yep means the same thing as yes. That's right. It's just an informal way of saying yes. Well, Jill, before we go, is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? We forgot to tell them about the two little words we use to end a conversation. And what are those? Bye-bye. <laughs> That's right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Learning English Podcast. And see you next time. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.